Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our lecture for advanced MPI techniques and we learned a lot about the message passing interface, MPI, before in this lecture and now we will touch on some of the extreme other functionalities we in basically didn't cover in the basics and also that of course uh, giving the extreme scale that is enabling this, um, is, it is an interesting technology. But before we go into the MPI techniques, um, let's go a little bit what we learned the last time in terms of the more conceptual ideas of really approaching high performance computing problems. So what is the reasoning for going to multi-core setups? And then of course, connecting different nodes, which all of them have multi-core nodes. So this is, of course, a topic that we will also look into today a little bit and give you some examples. But lecture three, really, the last time had a lot of this conceptual ideas of why parallelization makes sense to create a speed up and what domain decomposition options we have in order to increase the speed up or basically to break a very complicated problem into the very small and then actually computing it on different cores and then in the bigger picture compile everything together and we learned a little bit about what you see a little bit here in in this basic example why you would basically crunch a big problem into small admittedly the maximum of a global array from 16 items is not the biggest thing but it captures the essence of what we do in parallelization so instead of having one core doing this and going through all of these 16 array items what we here want to do is we say we can parallelize this on different cores that we have available these days, especially in the multi-core area. And then basically say all of them should have their maximum computing with you know using quite just a fraction of the problem space. And then we combine all of this in the so-called max global array value that then is reported as one of the maximums, of course, from all of the local problems. And this is, if you want, maybe one of the simplest parallelization problems and approaches, but of course it captures the essence of thinking about what we learned in the beginning of the course. You have again a big problem, you crunch it into different workers, hence divide and conquer. And the conquering step is here done by all the different workers. And then you actually join all of these you know, results which have been independently computed in order to reach basically the result of the problem. And this gives you a scalable option. The more cores you have, the more you can do. And we also learned that in the domain composition approaches, there are many options. In deep learning, you would say, in order to do matrix matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication, this is a very nice example um, where you have this color coding enabling now this kind of nicely independent parallel computing. So you can actually get these values just by ignoring everything else here. And just think about the colors, it's all what you need. Very simple operations and you can scale that up to very many. And that's how deep learning takes actually advantage of GPU chips. We will learn this in the lecture in the GPU lecture starting. And then later on in the deep learning lecture, we will see how that domain decomposition of sorts in this and also then the parallelization power of GPUs will really make a big difference in training of large deep learning networks for artificial intelligence today in many applications. But we have also seen the more, let's say, simulation sciences and physical methods approaches where you have an overall domain you want to actually study. And let's say it would be the weather prediction or the, the waves propagation in this area. You would say you can cut down the overall domain into different pieces and of course, the reality of the problem would be uh, basically related to how fine granular are you doing this? You see a coarse grain problem versus a fine grain problem, right? And of course, this will make a huge difference in the inference you can have from those models. So here we're thinking about really that each of these different parts will be independently computed first but also require lots of interactions. You can imagine if you want to have this here on the coast, uh, basically maybe um, uh, calculated what waves would you expect in the next hours, given the storm or so, 
you always have to compute this. And this brings us to the idea of MPI. Now, in the first place, we discussed at the beginning of the course, and now we'll enforce today a little bit more in strong patterns how you can do this. We learned that, of course, here, the message exchanges are crucial in this particular part, because in order to compute the waves height, for instance, um, you need the values of the of the neighboring cells around you. And then you have to propagate this information of your wave height to the other surrounding cells. Hence, here as an example, MPI broadcast, collective operations we learned before by using MPI is a good choice and often used in order to solve problems like that. But there are many other problems. There are particles in space. There are deep learning problems which have another nature. You can imagine that, of course, it is a very application domain specific question, how you do the domain decomposition. And not always you would say that each of these tiles where you would say um, is, is a tile here in the real domain, the processor decomposition can also look different, right? Saying that it's not always one CPU core to one decomposed domain tile. You can put more problems, uh, more processes to the problem. Think about memory bound problems that you have to maybe have more memory for this problem to store all the variables. Then on the other hand, we learned the last time that um, <clears throat> in a way it's an ideal scenario. So having this blocky thing here of the overall domain, just this kind of three dimensions, beautiful. But the world isn't like that. And especially HPC systems are not like that. They're limited in some point in ways. We have learned about the interconnects. We have learned about the different racks and the nodes. So they not can access all the memory space that this big overall domain entails. So having here uh, accurate weather prediction in the basically uh, European space or so will require that you break it down to different processors, different down to different nodes. So in there, we learned the interesting thing that, of course, we do simulations over time. So T0 informs in the one respect T1. But this brings us to another problem that in the other respect, we need the information what's happening around me in T0 to in order to compute the T1. So think about the waves again. This is a good illustrative example. So in order to calculate the wave height in the next time period. That's why he is a clock in the world, right? We are always advancing in time. We need to know, of course, the values before in the time step zero. And this was an important part leading later to something we call stencil methods and so on, but it's not the point. The point is here in this particular lecture in lecture three is that, of course, in order to do this, to always inform in time step zero, basically everything which is needed for time step one, which is the next step, you have to have some communication, some interaction. Of course, MPI to the, to the help here, but how you do this if you cut your domain at some point in time, what you have to do, because you cannot just simulate all of that in one kind of node which has access to memory. So the solution what we had for this problem was in the last time, which is a key in high performance computing applications, to really understand this is to have so-called ghost cells. So you don't override what's happening right now, essentially in this particular time, because you don't wanna override it, but still you need the values for the next time step to iterate. So what you would do is you do the message exchanges with MPI in order to fill the ghost cells. These cells, these halo layers, as they're sometimes called, are not really represented in the overall domain decomposition. It's not reality. It's artificially created from us to bring space in order to have, let's say, for if you think it bluntly from MPI send receive or the collectives to have some buffer space here for variables that then can be used and are filled in the time step basically I have right now that was that you can do the equations, that you can do the mathematical numerical methods in order to inform the next time step, which is here in this example, time step one. So in time step zero, I compute the actual values. I can do this because I have previously filled the halo layers. And then what I do at the end, before I come there, I fill the halo layers with the next necessary information from this time step in order to compute then in the next iteration of the whole code, time step one. 
this sounds pretty easy. And you think like this time steps and the overall domain decomposition that I show here, particularly in the lower left part, um, is pretty easy. So what's the problem? So think about that, of course, we have different load imbalance issues there if you do just doing it the simple so-called Cartesian way, maybe. So you would say here we have a lot of water, so waves are incredibly important right now. Here, somewhere in the fjord or basically somewhere close to the coast, it might be not so compute intensive to do the, let's say, wave propagation anymore. Or you have here an example from data mining where you want to do clustering. You remember I talked about the HPDB scan already before. Uh, DB scan clustering density based, where you see here lots of points being very close to each other. And when you want to cluster, this really matters and you have to compute distances and so on. But here you can see a very less distribution of points. And so the cost estimation you have to do to do a proper domain decomposition in terms of computing time, in terms of calculus, how much is it in order to do all the distance measures here? is not just beautifully in the middle. Here, the cost estimation of the cost of computing this would be, of course, a fraction of this. Hence, the domain decomposition that they would say is not here in the middle, what our brain suggests, and which is equal perhaps to some of those examples. Here, you would say it's better actually to cut it here to different processes. So this one is done by the processes and the other one to keep the load balance equal. Then the other part of parallelization fundamentals is definitely learning some um, terminology. So we do do parallelization just for fun. Um, parallelization is always used to achieve usually a so-called speed up of your problem at hand. If your problem is too small, then you maybe don't need HPC. You go for, let's say, local options. But if you have a big problem, you're always interested usually in the speed up. You want to parameterize. And there were two other terms we learned, which is very important in many of the applications we face, which is strong and weak scaling. So <clears throat> this strong scaling is usually that we say we want to understand how the relatively speed up is. And this means in order to do this, we basically would always you know, challenge. And basically, you see here with the ideal scaling, we keep the problem constant for each of these lines you would increase the number of cores but the problems for each of these lines stay constant so i can see the nice scale up here and this would be the linear scaling but which would be the optimal but at some point in time you will probably have a tail off because of communication issues with mpi or other factors like io we talked about it but this shows you essentially that, of course, a big problem can be crunched this number of cores into the small, let's say the number of particles here as the example. And then by throwing more cores in it, you can solve it very nicely and have a basically speed up of sorts. And this was one part of the part what we play in HPC. So this is a game, you throw more computing on it, and then you basically usually can improve, of course, you meet um, things like Amdahl's law and so on, like, you know, the serial limits will kick in, things like maybe I.O. patterns or even just the communication overheads and the serial limits in terms of creating the MPI environment and so forth. But we also learned the other part of the story, which is more Gustafsson's law, saying essentially when you, you basically um, think about a problem, we just want to increase the problem. There's always a way of increasing the granularity because we are into simulations usually of you know physical phenomena, and there's always a way to really make it more detailed, to put more core work. So there's no core getting idle in order to get the efficiency. So you see that a little bit represented here where you say, of course, we now increase the number of cores. That's what we do in HPC, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't go for the work. We always want to use as much of cores and nodes as we want. But instead of here keeping the, the, the work constant, we also say here, maybe we can increase granularity. We can use more computing by saying, instead of just keeping the work constant, so to speak, per core, we also increase the work per core here. And this you see basically by, by having this interesting factor that Essentially, if your thousand particles are per core um, actually computed, 
in order to find here and actually realize what, how the particles will react in basically 3D space and react and will work and move. But you also can say we, we really increase this significantly by using uh, 140,000 particles per core. So we increase the work even for each of the cores and see how the efficiency is, the parallel efficiency low here. And of course here, uh, which is of course in a sense unfair comparison, right? Because here we have a much more granularity factor uh, in these different applications, because here we have just 1,000 particles, per, uh, 10,000 particles per core, sorry, but here we have 140,000 particles per core. So that was what we learned last time, though the important terminology that you really need to know when you go out of this course, like halo and ghost cells, layers, as they're sometimes called, the load imbalance problem that you cannot chop a big problem in, in the real world just into, let's say, equal amounts of work. It will not work. There's basically always some imbalance and you have to deal with it, which is not easy. Um, the goal of doing parallelization, speed up, right? That's our our point. So if, and that of course make it maybe even possible, you would say speed up is not always the, the major point. If you have a real problem that is maybe impossible to do otherwise, you also would go for HPC and then do parallel computing, which makes sense of if you think about memory or if you think about let's say the, the train that we had before in some of the previous lectures, you don't want to burn a train 500 times, you rather do that in a computer, it's much more costly to do it really in the physical space. So, but in the end, if you do high performance computing, that means we want to achieve, you know, an increase of cores. Today's, we have to see that cores is a factor of saying multi-core or many cores, of course. See, it's lecture also will pick here today, lecture four, on some of these points where you maybe also use GPUs, where the world is not only so homogeneous of saying just more cores from the same type, you also want to accelerate your problem. And that's what we have today. And of course, there will be a dedicated lecture on GPUs and acceleration down the road in this course, where we then have this concept also revealed. So that's all what summarizes essentially a little bit lecture three. Let's come to lecture four, which is diving now a bit more in MPI. I still think it's a more theoretical conceptual lecture and we will see how that materializes then in the more practical lecture five then when we have data structures and parallel algorithms. But it shows you a little bit more what MPI can do. The last time it looked pretty, let's say simple and easy and just you know point to point communication, send, receive, receive, resend and so on. And then we have this interesting idea of having collectives. Okay, that's nice. And many of you work with this now in the assignment already. But MPI is extremely powerful. It has lots of operations. It has interesting communication patterns and you know methods like the blocking versus non-blocking communications. You can create your own communicators, uh, creating just arbitrary subgroups as we discussed in one of the lectures already. But then of course also systematic ones or let's say a bit more principle-based ones using a Cartesian communicator with a certain way of handling a problem. And of course, then we will reveal a little bit how the network interconnect plays into this. I always was saying, usually HPC systems have a very good high interconnect between the different nodes and cores because we want to communicate a lot. And of course, if you Cartesian communicator will show you why that is necessary and we already actually alluded to this a little bit when we thought about the water and then the wave propagation. It's almost impossible to go to the next, uh, let's say, Cartesian block if you don't know the height of the weight around you, right? Because water cannot be put in cells if you want to realistically essentially simulate it. So there's always an interconnect between the different cells in real life. And that's what we enable with high performance computer versus MPI. We will see some limits in the respect of task core mempics. So how does the virtual world of MPI in a way as software reflect to the physical world of really interconnects? And there's a small application example that's already advanced topics, just to show you that of course, that this is a interesting topic to study. The second part is much more, I think, usually accessible to students in a way that I always needed. Right, you can imagine. So when we compute the water and the waves at some coast in Iceland, we want to know the results. So we want to write this to files. 
So there will be input-output terminologies. What are the challenges in HPC systems, especially if you scale up your problem, as we discussed, in order to achieve a speed up. The more cores are in the game, you also will find that the file system underneath will have to struggle dealing with all these cores, maybe writing to many, many, many different files. If you have 1,000 cores working, assume they're a full-blown core with the application running. They can create a file of doing the output there. But if you do this 1,024 times, or maybe you scale up 2,048 and up and up and up, you can imagine the file system is quite some challenge to do to create all of these result files. It's exact or almost exact seconds in order to basically dump your results. Hence, <clears throat> also here we think about technologies we call parallel I.O. Also, if you think about that your results are usually binary, so there's perhaps no point necessarily to drop them all in a readable format if you, you know, compute them again later on or something like this. So we learn a bit about MPI I.O. techniques later in this part of the course. And with this about portable file formats, data science applications, examples, and so forth. So with this, you really understand more data intensive workloads, scalable networks. So why the networking aspect is a very important part of this. Um, more and more, I think the parallel computing and parallel programming part is fostered in this application with advanced MPI. You see that the parallel programming has many, many options, not only on the IO level we just said, but also with this asynchronous communication of not always having a send and receive, but also maybe have this kind of non-blocking send that just continues. And with this, we really are going to a HPC programming that is reflected in all the cutting edge applications we see outside today. Just remember a little bit, and this is a very short reminder, we are in the space of distributed memory. That's important to understand and realize in some of these things we've discussed today. We cannot access the memory of the other processor. That's our key foundation we had the last time and basically alluding to when we use MPI. And here you see the first thing where I said always, <clears throat> we had actually also in the Q&A some sessions. So MPI send, what's, what's actually, why is that, uh, you know, has to be a ping and pong, and then basically this matching thing. And in a way, you say it's it's wasted because if you have parallel computing um, and we have an MPI sent to send, maybe the MPI receive was a long time before, right? So you can imagine that by chance, the ping did something else before it actually sends a ping. So, um, and MPI receive, which essentially then is not the pong, it's just receiving the ping, um, was actually initiated a long time. So this is a waiting time in the end for this processor here. These are two processors independently from each other, having no access to memory, and they sent this message. Wouldn't it be nice to combine this with something which is a bit more, let's say, um, non-blocking, right? And this is for some of the ideas that we can do with the so-called MPI I send and MPI receive where we have a non-blocking communication that actually can be performed. And this is something which you also will have um, basically in several parts of the next assignment, but also of course in my demonstrations that I will do a little bit when it's about you know the next lecture, then I will take off some of these examples and show you um, how that actually works on the coding level. But of course you can now imagine when I send and I send, I can maybe still do a hell of a lot of things while this other processor is still receiving all the input. And this is on the network. Before I maybe do an MPI wait, so maybe I want to synchronize in some force. So this is a big difference. And um, of course, the different varieties in this um, with wait and wait all, where basically waits for all given MPI requests in a certain, let's say, request you send. And wait is basically um, a, a very specific way of doing this. And I think the practicals will really show you much more. But this is um, essentially that, that really the work can go on. So non-blocking communication can achieve sometimes that there's not really deadlock sometimes where you, you remember this MPI send cannot continue until there was an MPI receive on the other end. And this is blocking communication. So this time is all doing nothing in a sense. So here the idea is to have more throughput. 
And um, of course, with a non-blocking communication that we have here with iSend and so on, I still can do all the power of the collective operations, realizing that maybe if I address thousand processors, they're all in the different time of life right now. So you know, having this big large space, it could be a very wild jungle of message exchanges. And with this block, basically non-blocking MPI communication is a very power. Uh, full technique, but of course, also automatically a little bit, um, yeah, what should I say? It's a little bit more complicated because you don't have the straight application logic anymore of saying send and receive, and we just wait for each other. Think about the sort normal ping and pong, right? That was pretty obvious, rank zero, initiate the ping that looks like this, while maybe, you know, uh, rank one was then receiving and basically than doing the other way around. So pretty obvious code. If you have this I send, you have to do this waiting, you have this kind of synchronization um, aspects which complicates it more. And we will have more examples in lecture five about it. So I continue here with more powerful aspects of MPI, creating your own subgroups as was discussed now, I think quite a while now. Here's one specific um, idea how to do it. You can do MPI com split in order to maybe basically have this all range of communicates and you decide every one of these rows as an example should be cut into a different communicator, right? Pretty obvious. Uh, we could call it here a little bit color coded because we identified the colors and they should create a new communicator. By this, you also see they then get a new rank, right? But with the split functionality for, for MPI, you can actually achieve it and then achieve something like that one group is maybe think about the sailing of the boat and the progress on the boat on the waves, while the other are actually computing the wave propagation of the pure water in order to interact with this boat and to determine what is the weight height, uh, the wave height, and what is the, let's say, stress around the boat and so on to become a progress. So how that practically looks like is no surprise to you. I think com size, com rank, we have many times now we use these tools. And practically we say we have this four times four processors here, 16, we divide it by four. We do this in the world of MPI com world. So we have 16 processors here from zero to 15. So this is our whole world of processors. We divide them by the so-called color because there are four colors, we divide by four. And then what I get route is more this row communicator with new ranks and new sizes. And, and this is an important part to realize, this new ranks that you really have inside this. Uh, you're still the rank in this WorldCom indicator, but also the new ranks for each of these processors, basically in the new communicator we did. And then you can give that out, of course, in the new um, sort of breaking the big problem again into smaller problems. And what you usually should do is um, in the C program, basically to free this communicator that you created again, and basically before you do the MPI finalize. So you see, it's pretty obvious then to create subgroups for, co for communication, um, but there are also special MPI communicators which are always used and assignment two will actually use this Cartesian communicator that I now explained a little bit. But the name already suggests that there's a more systematic Cartesian grid to this. And in a way, that's a formal name of the things you already seen many lectures right now, right? There's a Cartesian grid over the input space. Uh, let it be the beach somewhere here at the lighthouse. Um, could be, you know, somewhere in Iceland, perhaps, um, where you have this to simulate. So of course, here you have the wave propagation in all of the different tiles almost equally. You have just different data to do this. There would be always waves going next tile, next tile, next tile, and then the other way around maybe. So it's not really known how you do in which direction. So, and there are a couple of elements to it that you create a new communicator out of ComWorld. Um, of course, you have to specify how big is the space of this Cartesian grid. Um, then basically, is it periodic or not? So will it stop at some point or do you just continue maybe with a permanent simulation and going around? And, you know, using this then in MPI messages um, and so on, the boat message messages that going forward and backward um, require this certain structure in the communication, which makes it very nice. 
in order to use this communicator. And that's why people are using this, of course, in order to do a more systematic approach to some of these problems. And that also means that, of course, you scale up very quickly, very high. You just increase the dimension of your problem. And then the Cartesian will, of course, go with you if you have the amount of course available. Although, in a way, you have to understand is, of course, this is a virtual topology. This is a Cartesian or graph topology in a way, um, what you can do. But it has nothing to do necessarily with the physical structure of your HPC system. We're now talking about the course we discussed already in the, in the scheduling that I scheduled basically more cores than a node had available. And then I was just using two nodes. Here, it's almost similar that you basically don't have this conceptual view of a node, which is physically then there and not there. You just think about MPI ranks, MPI processes to initiate to make it easier. How many nodes are then there is what you specify in the job description, basically of the HPC job description, the bad job. And that's why it's so powerful. So here's a good example of a three by four um, domain decomposition, let it be the ocean, and you want to have this wave propagations. Wave usually are then going with the wind. So let's assume the wind comes from here. If this rank zero wants to send to rank four and then to rank eight in a systematic way. But think about what we didn't know before was essentially what are my neighbors and how I can do this? Because essentially, we always had this unique identity, rank 0, 1, 2, 3, 7, 11, 10, etc. But we never know our environment. So basically, what is the core next to me, so to speak? I can send information to it. What is the MPI process? And here with this idea as so a rank and the columns, it gives you automatically the source and destination out of this communicator to say, in order to send down here, we actually want to say that this is something where we want to go to you at the fourth and then to the eight. And basically then you maybe do with a periodic idea to go and go one loop. So this is the power of this Cartesian. Um, as an example, of course, you can go the right way to left and down. And this is just, of course, of propagating now systematically in each of the different cells where you had your domain decomposition in order to basically crunch this big problem into the small. And how you would create this and do this in the code is something what we will do also in our assignment. So there it's maybe perhaps a bit more usual. You have to define if you want to do periodics. Um, and here you see the Cartesian create out of the COM world, the dimensions that you need to do, and then the previous definements of the periods and the reorder, giving you this new 2D kind of communicator, which is now Cartesian. And in basically, and then you got the coordinates and the shifts that you have to do in order to understand now the source and destination when you want to send something to. And essentially, here we're talking about lots of more details depending on the application or where you want to shift data to. But you know, you use it in the send and receive messages, then of course, using this communicator, and then can reuse this information that you get from this kind of shift in one specific direction, right? That's the idea of the shift, but it is not doing the shift really. It just obtains the ranks for the shifting. In a way, the real shifting, when I talk about shifting of data or information about the weight height, things like that, which you see here, it really needs a send and receive, or it leads a broadcast and things like that. So basically, you need a really MPI operation to sending, receiving, and so on. The shift gives you just a destination and source that you required to do a certain move in space. And this is a very important part, could be also exam relevant. And then when you think about hardware and communication issues, we will talk about this. There are lots of collective operations we will talk about. And we really have to shift the view to the more networking level, uh, thinking about of needs for synchronization, MPI barriers, um, and, and basically that the, the idea of HPC system is, of course, not using only gigabit Ethernet, which is sort of cheap, but also very powerful InfiniBand network connections um, that are high performance. And that's how you basically can also put it into it when you think about the larger picture of MPI. Um, here you see basically rank zero is just doing a sleep for some terms of work 
while rank one is storing all the results to file, which may be takes much more than just this 10. But in order to proceed with the application, you maybe do an MPI barrier and really wait essentially before you stop the whole program in order to finalize. This is one of the synchronization um, operations which MPI can do on a specific communicator, of course. So also this will be interesting because here we have lots of performance issues perhaps, which we will reveal in lecture eight then when we do performance analysis. In generally, however, we have to shift the view here if you want to understand this a little bit more to the networking level. So we do lots of communication and aspects. And of course, we will go into this a little bit on lecture eight as well. So networking can be a bottleneck, but we didn't really understand so far how this virtual MPI is now reflected in all of these you now really physical interactions between the cores and the topologies that can run in order to interconnect all of those. So let's dive a little bit into that. And where you usually think that, you know, we have lots of compute nodes, you have all the data, but the IO nodes, here's an example of a blue gene system, for instance, the IO nodes are of course here, the switches and the internet still a bottleneck. So you want to have high performance, like having a Taurus network here, every core with every neighbor connected, that some of them, of course, play a special role. And this could lead to contention because basically you have this IO nodes through all this is going the traffic to the switches and then to the IO, essentially meaning real storages, but they have a special role here. So if you now have a, this kind of Cartesian we demonstrated, of course, then this could be an overloading of some of these in order to do so. In this sense, let us look shortly a little bit, and this is not the main part of this course, and basically you should also look into more network oriented courses, maps. But of course, the HPC machines all have their specific high performance networks. The diameter of the network matters in a way, which is basically the shortest distance between two, let's say the far away nodes you can imagine in the HPC system. And this costs, you can imagine that all of these cables have of course incredibly costs to it. We talk about here and there optical cables. Um, and of course, some electrical cables, the optical cables are really cost a lot. And if you have, let's say, half a million of cores and everyone should be connected with the different nodes and so forth, we talk about high costs in the HPC systems. So, of course, on the other hand, you can imagine the more cables we really have, um, a little bit illustrated in this, let's say here, um, you can have higher performance. You have a basically non-blocking switch where you have you know, full bandwidth concurrently with these ports. But thinking about that this could be very costly brings us to this larger picture of network topologies. We have here an example of a very commonly known network topology called FAT3 network, where you see that basically everybody is fully connected to the, to the other layer and having basically, we call that switches here, um, more or less a leaf and a spine switch in order to get to this. Um, and with this double layer, so to speak, and with the connections you see here, you have a really nice performance, right? Um, and of course, it's very costly because now we have to implement this. Um, but the, the workers that really do the work here on the lower end have, of course, perfect performance to always communicate to any other core. And this is a beautiful situation, but also very costly if you think about um, if you connect them really with, with real cables. And I always think a way that although maybe today's systems are using Dragonfly and other topologies and so forth, um, the key problem still is that optical cables are still cost a lot in this you know, large scale HPC systems. Perhaps today it's a little bit, let's say also that GPUs cost a lot. So if you want to have A100s, four per core or further nodes, sorry, then you're essentially talking about high numbers as well. So in a one way, the networking cost, but also these days the accelerators, of course, play a big role in the cost as well. This basically enables you a little bit to understand the optimization that needs to take place on the network level, which could be almost another lecture series. So I keep it a little bit short that you think about um, maybe you're oversubscribing a little bit the network in the factory business you see here. It's not anymore basically that, that we had this leaf and spine fully connected as we saw before. You see here that we have um, essentially a one to three oversubscription in the communication link. Um, so we have here six to two, not anymore this full mesh. 
And it's in a way a bottleneck, of course. So think about those who want to communicate with some others. They just have these two connections and before it much more. But of course, that means saving costs a lot. And the question still remains, if not maybe two connections are good enough to solve many problems. Today, we even talk about much more advancements in this area. So here, many people use Dragonfly today, uh, which is a very interesting uh, topology structure. It's a hierarchical topology that has basically a more or less cheap alternative to this fat trees, where you have this fully mesh here in a sense, and there are these kind of local groups where the topology in these local links or basically in these local groups is basically can be different. And then the, the global groups is, of course, everybody has at least one link to others. But the interesting part is then, of course, that you have these local groups that maybe communicate a lot and then have a basically a sort of network with Reduction in terms of the diameter, right? So because you don't really go to every little core anymore, you have this group by setters, group by settings, so to speak, outside. If you want to dive more into this, there are also resources. I think for the idea of the lecture, it's not necessary to know much more about this Dragonfly and Dragonfly Plus, what we use in Jewels, for instance. But um, there are all sorts of network topologies that you can run. And you can imagine when we talk about the Cartesian, that's what we are interested in. A neighbor is talking to its neighbor, hopping, but then, of course, in also different directions. And if it's basically at the end of the core, it shouldn't stop there. So that you need a connection basically directly to the first core again. That's what we call a more or less multidimensional hypercube and a mesh network. Here's a 2D torus. You can imagine this with N, so ND torus networks that are actually then used in order to communicate. I want to give you a real example before we close the first part of the um, uh, lecture today. You see here Juvels, which is our top 500 system, number seven right now, number one in Europe, uh, which is based by, you know, or basically created by Atos uh, with a Bull Sequana system here. And uh, it's actually very powerful. Um, and of course, you can see, if you want to see how that really see, it looks like, the other look and feel, you have one of these blades here, right? So that is a real almost photograph here. You have the four GPUs here, right? That's important. Then basically you have this EPIC CPUs on the right, which each of those have basically kind of uh, two times 24 cores. And then you have on the lower level here, basically the interconnects. Of course, for the cards to interconnect, you also need this, hey, this kind of, we call that um, high dynamic range um, enabled InfiniBand connections. Here you see this a little bit more on a conceptual view. So this is the real picture, you know, and then of course people use this normally to describe these large pictures to do a more conceptual picture, which is the same like you see here. You have still the four GPUs, which are the A100 here with 609, uh, 6,912 CUDA cores. It's a many core system and each of those has so many cores being four together in one of these blade or node, if you want. And then of course the network adapters, which you see the connect X6 that then gets the interconnect with the so-called InfiniBand, um, uh, which is of course a high performance network really to deliver this high performance connectivity. Here's a more network view on this from Mellanox, but I think you get the idea as well. And then when you think about that, all of them, all of these so-called cells and local groups have this Dragonfly Plus idea of a topology um, that was happening basically inside this cluster. We can also connect it then to the cluster module, which was, if you remember from modular supercomputing, another module available in Jewels to do other performance computing, uh, which has no, uh, basically not so much GPUs. So the idea of using a booster here would be then really leveraging the GPUs. But this was a very specific example. And I close here, um, basically in this particular lecture with the idea of communication optimization, but just task core mapping. This has been studied but it's incredibly hard to do where you think about, is it beneficial to think long about those which are you know, communicating a lot to each other? Can we do an optimal placement of these units in all of these network topologies? And of course you do MPI profiling, you can measure this, 
how much it takes to do the message exchanges. We talk about this in later lectures about performance analysis, but still it proved to be very tough. Um, in order to get here, really results that matter very well. Uh, basically, we have done some studies and many others to study. You usually can, of course, more or less here and there improve perhaps, but it takes a long time to understand really the idea of doing this, especially if you move to a very high scaling of sorts, right? You usually can say by optimizing this task core mappings of the MPI task to the real core to enable that they're really close to each other, um, we have an improvement of performance from just one to three percent. And in the end, you have to see that the amount of work that is going in to understand that fully is also taking a lot of time where you always have to question, is it worse to do the one to three performance improvement? But there are ways to doing this. And I think performance analysis and improvements here and there also will help us towards this, what we have in later lectures. But let us close today with the idea really summarizing what this so-called InfiniBand is. By now, I think many of you have understood that this is a very specific network for high-performance computing. So let us reveal a little bit what that actually means. It used to be that when you heard of high-performance computing, you would imagine a monolithic mainframe computer filling a room and clacking away at numerical calculations. But that's not the case anymore. From simulations and modeling to machine learning, high-performance computing is now needed in almost every industry, and it's not done with giant computers anymore. High-performance computing today is achieved through the use of clusters of small servers. These clusters can be small, medium, or very large. But in all cases, the servers need to communicate with each other very quickly to operate in unison and achieve high performance. This is where InfiniBand started, but it did not stop there. Today, many different industries share the need for a fast interconnect. InfiniBand is the fastest networking technology available today. In a world where we have so much data moving and needing to be analyzed, the last thing the application needs is to waste valuable CPU time either transporting or waiting for the data. Instead, with native RDMA capabilities, meaning there is little overhead on the CPU, data can move between servers without distracting the CPU from the application. InfiniBand delivers business advantages and competitive leadership for any data center size, as it enables maximum performance from the CPUs and storage. The in-network computing capabilities of InfiniBand allow data to be analyzed while in transit, offering the best application performance and return on investment for cluster computing infrastructure. As a public standard, InfiniBand can be processor agnostic, supporting many vendors' processors and coprocessor technologies. InfiniBand also has the lowest latency of any interconnect, allowing data to make round-trip journeys in a fraction of the time enabled by other technologies. And InfiniBand can be deployed in many fabric configurations. From Fat Tree to Taurus, Hypercube, Dragonfly, and many other topologies, allowing users to match the network design to their application's needs. What's more, InfiniBand products are backwards and forward compatible, meaning that prior and current generations of devices will work with the devices of tomorrow. This extends the life of past investments and realizes a much better return on investment than proprietary technologies, which require rip and replace forklift upgrades. So what good can come of clustered computing? Think about thousands of computers analyzing data and running simulations, helping us find cures for diseases that could not be found in any other way, or enabling machines to learn. Think face recognition, fraud detection, or voice recognition. Imagine a computer describing a photo or video to a blind person. Possibilities are being uncovered every day. The members of the InfiniBand Trade Association are committed to delivering the best interconnect technology and increasing the speed, efficiency, and scalability of high-performance networks. And through the use of these clusters, companies from around the globe are working to make the world a better place. To learn more, visit us at InfiniBandTA.org. All right. So <clears throat> definitely an important part to realize in in this lecture, InfiniBand, and I hope it showed you a little bit of insight. We close here and continue with the second part of this lecture by looking more into I.O. capabilities.